back to the Tavern Between Dimensions, your monthly tabletop RPG podcast. Now we sit down before the screen in the players' round where we discuss things that concern the players. So, you've had this idea for a very long time, Mm -hmm. and you've never had the right campaign to play it, and you've suddenly brought it to the table, and your Legolas S character doesn't quite fit in with the space opera that everyone's chosen to play. Ah, yes, that would happen. So how do we make our characters fit the campaign settings they're in? So are we talking about joining a new campaign or joining an existing one? Because I think those are quite different, right? Well, no, I... I mean, I guess in a way either. I I mean, if we're looking at like the concept of a new, like, you know, maybe you're a pre-existing group, you've just wrapped up one adventure and you're moving on to the next one, or, you know, you're, you're coming together and... Uh, you've just hired yourself a beautiful <laughs> professional DM, you know, and if you start from scratch, I think let, let, let's start there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because arguably there's like like two primary ways you, you approach this conundrum, right? Mm-hmm. New like, campaign, right? Yeah. You either you have a character mm-hmm. pre-planned or you don't. Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of the binary decision at this point. And then you kind of play musical chairs with the other characters to see who ends up without a chair, right? That's sure. basically how it ends up, mostly. Yeah. So do you think of it in, like, you have a, a leader or a social-type character who typically deals with everything charisma-based? Uh, you have your tank, your healer, and your muscle, and then you can have ranged attack or up-close attack, whatever. But you don't want to mess around too much with that, and so... You were saying, Dan, you wait until you see what's taken mm. and you go from there, right? I mean, that's that's an interesting point that you bring up the roles. I mean, you know, the, the way I've seen it, uh, and I, I've seen it very recently, right? Because, you know, we've we've just started Witchlight. And I very, very deliberately, <laughs> sure, I created like 16 characters, one for each class. I, you know, I, had all, I have all these character concepts just swirling around in my head for some reason. But I didn't know going into Session Zero who I was going to leave Session Zero on my character sheet. <laughs> like with on my character sheet um but yeah i very specifically kind of sat back i looked at what everyone else really wanted to play personally i you know i looked at the the party composition and then i thought right i if i choose this character which turned out to be sprock goblin artificer i'm not going to step on anyone's toes from a thematic perspective mm-hmm. from a role perspective um i'll be able to complement them in in the ways that i can and that's how i chose it but like carl in the past you've mentioned that like katya was a character that you've had like literally conjured from your dreams for for some time so i mean sure you kind of knew what the gist of the cormier campaign was ahead of time yeah. but there was also that sense of like i definitely want to make this character work yeah. So that's kind of the the paradigm, right? Like you you either have a character or you don't. But yeah, like, like Carl, how like in, in terms of Katya, did you like was there much tweaking to bring Katya into the game? Thankfully into for Katya, no, there wasn't because the way obviously she you know she came about in in, in the dream and everything, it was sort of generic fantasy. And when I designed it, the idea was generic fantasy. So it didn't really matter which one I, I, I brought it to or which campaign you eventually did run. Sure. Or, you know, I could just slot her in there and, you know, she would work. And luckily, uh, and I, no one else was playing a bard, right? Yeah. So it just and kind that of was, worked. That was the other thing as well. Because I imagine if someone had have turned around and been like, I really wanted to play a bard, you know, I, I probably would have saved Katya for a, another campaign. Because in that regards, you know, I've played with you long enough that I could play anything and have fun. Mm. Thankfully, no one turned around and wanted to play a bard, so that was, that was my, my opportunity. But I know I've definitely had characters where I've had to sit there and be like, this doesn't, this doesn't fit the brief. And, uh, and Chris, what about you? How do you plan if you're joining a new campaign? Do you come in with like 12 characters and you pick one or do you have one specifically and you hope it matches? So I typically have rather, I have a couple of archetypes that I'll go with. Mm-hmm. So rather than have a class and a race combination, I'll have a rough idea of a holy warrior. So whether that's a war cleric or a zealot barbarian or a vengeance paladin, you know, or I want to have someone extremely agile. Now that could be a blade dancer wizard you know, it doesn't have to be a, a, a monk or a, you know, a rogue or something like that. 
Um, but I think it's often fun when you just come up with silly concepts when you think about like, um, and I'm sure we'll come into this later, what would this person be? Like, if, if I was to look at Rambo, what would Rambo be? Well, he's a ranger, right? Like, he's a high survival yeah. ranger. He's, he's out in the wild. Uh, you could probably add in a little bit of that, that kind of thing. So where do I want my character to be? So one of my players often plays moody goths. And so... When, when they found the tragedy bard in the Tauderai campaign yeah. setting, they were like, oh, this is perfect. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to... So every time you get a critical one, I'm going to take the... So I'm going to rip you and I'm going to get a bardic inspiration back. Like, that's perfect for me. Uh, sardonic, you know, just sitting in the back. Oh, well, actually... Have, <laughs> have you read the poetry of such and such? Like, that kind of thing. It's brilliant. At the same time, like, if you think of somebody like a tunnel fighter... So rather than have, like, I'm going to be a fighter rogue, like, I'm a tunnel fighter. Where does that fit? I think that's really important to do. Like, but at the same time, if I came into a campaign and someone said, oh, I'm playing the typical edgelord rogue, <laughs> who's who happens to be a drow forsaken his people, I'd go, well, I, I guess I'm not going to be a tabaxi monk then. You know, I, I want to compliment as well. Mm. I got you. Yeah. And so would you change your approach if it was an existing campaign? So say either your character died or you're joining a campaign mid in the middle. Oh, yeah. Would that change your approach? Yeah, 100%. I, I would want to know how the pie is made up, what they've done so far, and where they're going to meet me. Yeah. If, if you're going into a major city and I want to be a barbarian, why is a barbarian in a major city? Like, wouldn't you meet me out on the plains or... Is my have we gone to beseech the king for help, or because our lands have began to rot? Is there a plot hook line that I can help out with here? Okay. Like, where do you compliment? And it, it's all about that complementary playstyle. Yeah. Mm. So you want to be helpful and useful in, in that campaign. So that will determine your character choice. Every piece of D and D to me is group narration. So you should be working as a group to push the story forward. Yeah. If whether that group, you're the heroes and you're saving the land or you're the evil bastard goblin clan, you know, you need to work with that group. You are not by yourself the lone warrior because that's a different game. Yeah. Have you ever had groups where there are two wizards or two rogues? And has yeah. that worked? Has that been okay? I've got one right now. I've got a swashbuckler and an arcane trickster and it's great because one's a pirate who likes to set his... Uh, rope arrows the light and fire them in and the other one likes to hide and then push people over with telekinetic shoves and things like that yeah. it's, <laughs> so it's very different if there were two swashbucklers i would say well look mm. you're either going to know each other or hate each other and we're going to have a pirates of the caribbean situation here but as long as it works <laughs> and uh, it's yeah. fine like it, it's okay to have two of the same thing because as long as they're played very differently i think like in terms of you know, class choice, for example. I think another thing that we can kind of look at is like, does the campaign itself suggest or kind of promote certain classes or archetypes over another? So something that I find really kind of intriguing, one of the, the players in this Witchlight group, they are playing in a Strixhaven campaign, which, mm -hmm. you know, D&D, &D, Harry Potter, like D&D, yeah. &D, Witchcraft and Wizardry. They are playing a Barbarian. Oh, yes. And then when I, when I probed... Uh, and so I asked, because uh, they were wondering about, because they're they about to hit level three, they were questioning subclasses. I instinctively went, well, Path of Wild Magic, right? Yeah. You know, because it's a magic magic oh, really? setting. And, but they turned around and were like, well, kind of no, actually. I, I'm thinking of going down more the shapeshift route. And it was interesting because, you know, for me to kind of play in a, for example, strict saving campaign and then mm -hmm. not be a spellcaster... Um, kind of boggles my mind. Sure, they get uh, spells from strict saving backgrounds and that, but that was almost like a statement piece. I'm playing someone that literally turns off spell casting ability when I do my thing. But it sounds like you know, this barbarian character is one of the most interesting in the group. So there, there is that idea of actually striking out against the grain very deliberately <laughs> is is kind of a, a choice. But you know, I'm sure if you were to play a more steampunky, like an Eberron setting, you might run the risk that everyone wants to be an artificer because it's Eberron. And everyone yeah. wants to be the tinkerer in the world of tinkers, tinkerers. I think... Don't you think that every good wizard needs a bit of muscle? So every good wizard needs a barbarian next to them. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there, there is a place for that, right? Within those worlds. Like, 
you might go to an undersea of dwarves and it's 90 percent dwarves but you know what they're going to need to have interactions with folks who come in and trade and that there's got to be some crossover now don't get me wrong look if you're playing you you gave this example earlier dan right like if you're playing a low magic setting and you want to play an evocation wizard or something like that there's got to be a sensible conversation yeah so you yeah. touched on an interesting point chris is that the most important thing when choosing your character is making sure they integrate well with the party. Mm. And I think beyond the role, the class, the background, all that is almost immaterial. You just have to find, as you said, that hook that makes them fit in with the party or, or, yeah. or fit in with the campaign at least so that mm. they're on board. Yeah. Every single module the Wizards release, the NPCs have reasons to go with you or not go with you. Mm. So in the descent into avernus the the clear one for me is you meet one of the hell riders and based on what you do she will decide if she wants to come with you and she will have difficulties listen everybody loves a good npc when they're fighting alongside you it's great and that's what player characters should decide if i'm going to align with this existing party or with the new party why am i out to save the world with these guys why am i not striking out alone do I have a reason? Well, I'll be on the witch light, right? Yeah. Am I going to go and find Sabilna? Because yeah. uh, she, she's the patron. What reason do I have? Um, do I have a strong bond with these other characters that makes me want to go out? Why would each of the Goonies be with the other Goonies? That's, mm. <laughs> That's a good yeah. one. Personally, I feel if your character concept after creation if it is strongly tied to the themes and ideas of the campaign and those of the, the other characters around you. you I, personally, I feel you're just going to have a much stronger bond and connection to the story being told. Like, I would never dream of playing while beyond the Witchlight with a murder death hobo kind of build. Like, it, if I if I rocked up and was like, yeah, I'm going to play this absolute blender of a chaotic evil character, like, I would be at so so much at odds with the campaign. I, I struggle to think how I'd yeah. even have fun. And you're, um, you're touching on another point I was going to bring up, actually, is that role class background, that doesn't really matter. But I feel like alignment kind of does. right? I don't know if you agree, Carl uh, and uh, Chris. I mean, that again, there's a part of me that... I, personally, I'm not 100% on board with the whole 3x3 three three alignment grid. Mm. Uh, I think... To be genuine with it, you have to be much more fluid than that. And personally, although it can be a guideline, I find that sticking to the three by three stringently can create bad roleplay. But yeah, I you think don't let the, the alignment guide your decisions. Yeah, but I think uh, the campaigns also affect like where is appropriate, right? Because if if we were playing something akin to a shadow run campaign where you are literally career criminals and you're playing that in like a fifth edition style setting then actually the more kind of morally gray uh the, the neutrals maybe down to like lawful evil neutral evil like those are okay because the the setting promotes that right mm -hmm. if you're in a world of backstabbing and skullduggery then those alignments are going to fit better than if actually a dm's turn around and gone oh i've got this my little pony homebrew <laughs> you know <laughs> Sure. But if you imagine if you've got a party of like lawful good and neutral good characters, generally, that's roughly where they sit. And suddenly there's another player integrating the campaign, integrating the, the party, and they're neutral evil. Like, is that okay? Like, What's the goal? Yeah, absolutely. What's the goals of the characters? Yeah. So in all good fiction, um, so I'll bring this up as a Transformers fan. Even in Transformers, Megatron and Optimus Prime teamed up a few times because they had a greater evil. Yeah, like they yeah. they they recognized that to do this, uh, they had to, I don't know, get rid of Starscream or whatever it was at the time. <laughs> there there was a common aligned goal, so the decisions along the way might be a little bit more difficult because mm -hmm. one might say, well, I don't care, let's just kill him and leave him on the side of the road for the, and the Paladin steps in. No, that's not correct. It's not right by, by Torm or whatever, mm -hmm. but. As long as the goal is there, I think that can create some interesting elements. So if the goal is to find One-Eyed Willie's treasure, to take another Goonies reference, <laughs> and everybody's in it together, then yeah, you, you can have a chaotic evil goblin who's running around doing nut, nutty things. 
as long as the Goliath barbarian's there to pick him up by the scruff of the neck and drag him along to the next piece. And I think we've we've mentioned like the the paladin rogue dynamic in the past. It's, you're right. You know, it's it's always a fun one to play if done right. If done right, yeah. I think that's the main thing. Mm. Uh, all the players have to be very conscious of that choice and buy into it. I think. Um, going well back to to a point you you brought up about kind of archetypes, it made me think that, and this might make Carl smirk, but across multiple campaigns in multiple styles and genres. I've got a character that keeps on rearing his beautifully maintained head, Meridius. Mm -hmm. So like, this is a character who bounces, who's been in a steampunk campaign, he was in Prince of the Apocalypse, he was in uh, Neverwinter, uh, like Neverwinter kind of sleuthy espionage type thing, um, he's been in a Viking themed uh, <laughs> setting. And, you know, that idea of like, oh, I've got this character that I really, really want to play. I can rock up knowing I'm going to play Meridius, but he's deliberately like this kind of build chameleon. The idea is that effectively I'm just taking the, the smooth, suave, charismatic personality and mm -hmm. then just going, what? Like, what am I? So in this one, he's going to be a gunslinger. In this one, he's going to be a sorcerer. Mary plays out the same from a personality perspective. So I get to... You know, make all of those happy feelings in my brain because I'm playing Merry. But I can make sure that I'm still fitting into the the campaign as, as a whole. I've got you. Yeah, he was a he was a trade prince in this Viking uh, Viking thing, and mm. yeah, he was a. That's right. Uh, it, Carl's your Final Fantasy Pathfinder game uh, yep. Meridia was <laughs> a gunbreaker. You know, she Didn't. was a. Didn't know how to step down with a fight with a samurai, though, did she? No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, she was... And even through it all, you know, Mary's always been a bit more kind of smarmy, upper class, um, but likes the rough and tumble. So the personality tropes are kind of the same. But, as I say, having that kind of chameleonic ability to just go, well, I'm going to remold Mary to fit this campaign to, you know, to, to make everything make sense rather than saying oh we're playing a new campaign yeah he's still a gunslinger i feel like this might be a dm skill because well, you no, mentioned it chris has mentioned it mm. i'm unable to do that like, <laughs> no. the class is the class i'm not going to transpose it into another build that just sounds like crazy talk Fun fundamentally what what he's doing is is he's taking one character sheet just chopping out the name and personality and whatever campaign you could just glue those parts on <laughs> yeah no it's you great know, it's... i mean i wish i'd be able to do that i just, I just don't think i can <laughs> so, Anton, if you took your career now, what you yep. do, um, yes. and you career said, well, criminal. actually, it, yeah, if you weren't a career criminal, and you said, well, actually, I'm going to be IT tech support. Yeah. That's uh, correct. Like, that's the same thing. Am I skimming passwords <laughs> off people? Is that what I'm doing? Well, there's the thing. That's your personality, and that's your intention <laughs> oh, okay. to be chaotic evil. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> So your your intentions as Anton, rather than help Nicolas Cage with his latest blockbuster, are uh, yeah. to go over and uh, help people learn how to turn it off and on again. That's those yeah, are the yeah. two. Di that, that's the dichotomy that you'd uh, you'd have there. But like Dan, for example, my wizard Magnus cannot be a bard. Like his personality does not. He could be a soldier though. Could be a paladin. Can't be a bard. Can't be a sorcerer. You, mm, no. no, you could. You could be a bard and a soldier still. Like. Yeah, you, well, you could very much still do that. Uh, I mean, if you want to put it to a more modern setting, he could be a war journalist. I yeah. mean, I'll think about it. I think the, I'll try it out. I think the, the I suppose the counterpoint to that, like you know, compare it to Meridius. Like Meridius wouldn't be a barbarian. Like I'd never okay. play Meridius as a barbarian. But, so there's there's a um, limit to how far you can push it. Yeah, but uh, you know, so in that sense, I'll I'll look at what's available. So I, I guess another example is that Meridius crops up in the Shadowrun campaign, uh, yeah. and he's definitely not a sorcerer. And like it, you know, I take that personality of this smooth, suave kind of character, this this fixer, if you will, and Merry is now the leader of the underground, uh, mm -hmm. like London Underground. He's the guy who knows everyone, and like through the silver tongue kind of talks to them and kind of make sure everything runs smoothly yeah. um he's fit seamlessly into that into that setting he's still okay. merry i'm going to use this i'm going to recycle some of my old characters this way i've never thought about it but yeah. uh, pro like pro player tip right there recycle i might i might characters. be 
I might be uh, overstepping the line here, but I I can't help but feel that there are some similarities between, say, Magnus in the Cormier campaign yes. and Marcus in the Shadowrun campaign. No. Uh... Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Both sport name. beautiful moustaches. Yes. They're no nonsense. Get the job done. Follow the plan. Uh, listen here, you scruffs. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just playing alternate versions of myself. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've not seen the Shadow Run. I've seen the the Cormier, but as soon as Dan described, it, I was like, oh, it's just Anton. Like, that's... <laughs> oh, yeah. pretty much. Like, there's a reason Magnus is my icon on my Twitter account. That's like, well, okay, we can leave that there. Sure. Awesome, awesome. So as we can sort of see. It's not always a bad thing to have to change your character concept when you arrive at a table. You can mold them any way you see fit. You can do it Dan's way and just always use the same name and personality. You can do it Anton's way where you just, you know, play yourself, you know. <laughs> but yeah. whichever way you do it, there is no wrong way. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe the way that you do it down below and let us know how you adapt your character to different campaigns. But for ourselves here at the tavern, we're going to move on to the DM's table. Thanks for watching. We release segments like this from the Tavern Between Dimensions every Friday here on the Explorers of Elsewhere channel. Otherwise, if you want to listen to the episode in full, you can check us out on Spotify and Amazon Music.